pleased to be the Labour Party's parliamentary candidate for the Shipley constituency and I'm hoping uh, as and when there's a general election we'll be winning that seat and uh, putting a Labour government in and where's a uh, Secretary of State. So um, I'm really um, uh, delighted to um, introduce the authors of the report who are going to speak first and outline for you uh, just some of the uh, key recommendations they are making uh, in this report to the Labour Party. Um, and um, for those of you who have, have seen advanced copy, um, it's a really, really rich report. So I'm very much looking forward uh, to hearing first from uh, Andrew Harrop, who is the General Secretary of the Faith Fabian Society. Um, of course, Andrew has a very long track record, having worked uh, in ageing uh, in uh, his previous uh, career, and so I think it's been uh, brilliant to see him return to this issue in his role as the, um, the General Secretary of the Fabian Society. And we're also going to hear uh, him speak together with Ben Cooper, um, who is a senior researcher at the Fabian Society <coughs> and was co-author of the report. So we're going to start from hearing from them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, one year ago, Wes and Unison asked the Fabian Society to examine how to gradually build a new system of adult social care for England, a national care service. It has been an honour to conduct such important work. Over the months, we've heard from hundreds of individuals and organisations and have been helped by so many people, many of them in this room. Today we unveil our proposals, a long-term roadmap to a comprehensive care service for England. We're delighted to have worked with Unison and Labour and by their commitment to the concept of a national care service. But these are our ideas, not theirs. Advice, not policy. The backdrop of the project is an adult social care system on its knees. This winter's hospital discharge crisis was only a symptom of much wider problems. Since 2010, spending on adult care has fallen hugely relative to levels of need. Access to care has been unfairly rationed and many people who need help aren't getting vital support. Publicly funded provision is often patchy, impersonal and inadequate. Poor pay and conditions have helped trigger a staffing crisis in the sector with 165,000 vacancies. Unpaid family carers are left to pick up the pieces and people receiving support are paying charges they often find punishing. But extra spending will not be enough to address these problems on its own. Money must come with reform. The report makes 48 recommendations, too many, you'll be relieved to hear, to cover in a short introduction. Between us, Ben and I will highlight five themes from the package. First, we need a fair workforce settlement. In order of sequencing, this is where to start, because if we don't make progress towards a new deal for care workers, we will not be able to recruit and retain the people the system requires either now or as more need support in the future. We want to see a sector-wide fair pay agreement negotiated, including an adult social care minimum wage and minimum employment conditions. These will apply to everyone who works in adult social care, though with flexibility for directly employed personal assistants. Going further, People working for independent providers contracted to the National Care Service would have national pay bans and employment terms designed to achieve parity over time with similar roles in the NHS. As it becomes affordable, our publicly funded care workforce should have the same rewards, respect and career structure as their colleagues and partners in healthcare. Second, we want to build a service that is for everyone. Under our plan, support will be available to anyone needing help, regardless of their means. There will be an end to the binary divide between people receiving local authority support and self-funders, 
with everyone inside the tent. And help will be there at an earlier stage, as people's care and support needs develop, with resources set aside for preventative, open access community support and housing adaptations. People known to be disabled or carers would be automatically referred to the service by the NHS or the DWP. The National Care Service would reach out to you rather than you having to fight to find it. The goal is for everyone to have peace of mind about help being there for them when they need it. These are the first two of our five priorities and it's already a big package of reform. I now hand over to my colleague Ben Cooper to outline three further priorities. Can I start actually by thanking you, Andy, um, for asking me to work with you on this project. Over the past 12 months, it has been an honour to work with such a dedicated expert in social care. I've learned a lot, and I hope through our work together, you maybe have learned something from me as well. More than 50 years ago, as the House of Commons debated the world's first legislation to recognise the rights of disabled people, the Labour MP Alf Morris spoke of a different future for millions. A future where every disabled person is able to live where they choose, in a place they call home, with the people they love, doing the things they want in the communities that matter to them. As a disabled person, I know that for all the progress we have made over the past five decades, we are still so far from securing that future. Thousands of people going without support, struggling without the independence they deserve. That is the price paid by disabled people because of our failure to fix social care. Today, the National Care Service is words on a page. A lot of words on a page, I will admit. <laughs> But turned into reality through steady reform, it can be the next necessary step that ensures everyone can thrive and live the life they choose. As Andy indicated, there are three more key themes of our roadmap. So let me start with the third. We want to build a system with stronger rights and entitlements. That, that would be set out in a National Care Service constitution, co-produced with disabled people, older people and carers. People will have control and choice over the support they get. And everyone who draws on social care will have a new right to live independently and in a place of their choice. Fourth, we want to see adult social care turned into a comprehensive public service. We want to end postcode lotteries in support and provision. So the National Care Service will offer comprehensive help under a shared brand uniting national government, councils and licensed care providers in a shared purpose. National government will have new responsibilities for leadership, investment, workforce and national standards. Councils will receive the funding they require to meet needs in their area and greater flexibility to commission the services that are right for their community with more non-profit and public provision if they choose. There will be long-term, properly funded partnerships with providers, a deal where they are fairly paid but are expected to operate as part of a public service with new standards in care quality, workforce investment and financial conduct. Fifth, we want to see services become more affordable over time. We set out how reforms to care funding should accompany other changes, not be prioritised over them, because at a time when public finances are tight, it's crucial to help those who are missing out on support to access what they need, as well as making it more affordable. To do this, we recommend that any incoming minister should match any government funding reforms announced before the election. And then, as the new service develops, other options should be considered, including making support free for people with lifelong disabilities. What Andy and I have outlined today is a substantial package of reform that would take at least 10 years to realise. 
the National Care Service would amount to a shared national endeavour to give every individual the right support in the right way at the right time to live well and independently. It will be transformative to the lives of hundreds of thousands of disabled people, older people and carers. I know this because as someone who will draw on social care in the future, either in the next few years or the next few decades, the idea of a national care service gives me confidence and security. Confidence that whenever that day comes, it will not be a moment to fear. Instead, it will be a new chapter of life supported by those who care. Security, confidence and support guaranteed. Just as the past generation built the National Health Service for the 20th century, we can build the National Care Service for the 21st. Thank you very much. very much um, Andy and Ben. Um, I was recalling as uh, I was preparing for today that uh, back in 2010 when I was um, uh, working at the King's Fund I hosted the then Prime Minister Gordon Brown for a very important speech uh, in which he was setting out uh, Labour's vision for a national care service. Now, as many of you who uh, remember, unfortunately, we didn't get the opportunity as Labour uh, to remain in power to see that uh, followed through and implemented. And obviously, uh, I am therefore very delighted to be introducing who, uh, someone who I hope will be our next uh, Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. And it's really great that Labour will be going, hopefully, into power with plans uh, to, um, to act at the beginning of the uh, government and, and not leave it uh, until the end. So I'm delighted to uh, introduce Wes Streeting, who is um, MP for Ilford North and Shadow Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. Thank Thank you. You. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you to Andy and Ben for uh, both for your introduction, but also for the extraordinary amount of work that you've put into uh, this report. Um, I've reached a stage in my life at the age of 40 where social care has become personal, not just political. I'm thinking about um, just my immediate family in recent weeks, uh, two ways in which my family have been directly uh, touched by the issues in the report. One close relative, working age, disabled woman, having real difficulties at work because she doesn't receive the support that she needs as a disabled person to en enable her to flourish in the career that she loves teaching children. Uh, in another case, an older relative uh, had a series of TIAs, mini strokes, and she is now entirely dependent on the support um, not just from family, of course, but from the people who come in uh, every day from the NHS and, and, and social care services to make sure that she has a good quality of life as she seeks to recover um, from her illness. And I think as soon as any of us have to rely on the social care system, it becomes clear that it is not providing an adequate safety net. I think, in fact, lots of people in this country still don't know what social care is and by the time they find out it's too late they realize it's very expensive and very poor in too many cases cradle to grave increasingly feels like a dream uh, that has not been achieved how have things got this bad what well, actually goes back to anna's introduction in a way uh, in and i'll resist temptations to do my gordon brown impression um, <laughs> In, in 2009, Andy Burnham invited opposition parties in for talks to find a cross-party, long-term solution to the social care crisis. Uh, and instead of welcoming those generous efforts, the Conservatives used Andy's proposals as a stick with which to beat Labour in the general election campaign, and we know what happened next. David Cameron was then too ashamed to put, any, put forward any solutions at all during his time in Number 10, something that he later said was one of his biggest regrets from his time in office, although that didn't stop him taking an axe to the social care budget. Theresa May's plans for social care unravelled within days. Jeremy Hunt said the biggest regret of his career was not fixing social care, 
and then he became chancellor and swiftly kicked the government's policy into the long grass. We now read in the papers that Rishi Sunak plans to ditch, uh, ditch it all together. Meanwhile, a record half a million people are waiting for a care package today. Uh, delay has a cost. 150,000 people passed away in the last five years while they were waiting for care. We've had 13 years of over-promising and under-delivering from the Conservatives, so Labour will not be making the same mistake. We set out our priorities for social care and begun to outline how we will deliver on them. First, we've got to address the workforce crisis. There are 165,000 vacancies in social care today, but at the same time, care workers are leaving in their droves to work at places like Amazon, who, last time I checked, weren't famous for being a great employer. So what does it say about this vital public service that so many people are leaving it to work for companies like Amazon? It won't be undervalued by a Labour government, and neither will the people who work in it. Our New Deal for Working People will give proper rights to care workers, banning zero-hour contracts, expanding access to parental leave, better protection for pregnant women, fundamental rights from day one, and finally, an end to the unjust practice of fire and rehire, which Unison has campaigned so strongly against. And if there was one moment that put to bed forever the Conservatives' claim to be the party on the side of working people, it's surely this. Carers told to isolate without sick pay in the middle of a global pandemic. No one should be forced to choose between going to work to feed your family or isolating at home to protect public health. And the problem with Rishi Sunak is that he can't imagine ever being faced with that choice. He simply doesn't know what life is like for most people in our country. You don't need to tell me or Bridget Phillipson the importance of good public services. We wouldn't be where we are today without them. You don't need to persuade Keir Starmer on the value of care. His mum gave to our NHS for years as a nurse and then depended on the health service later in life when she fell seriously ill. And you certainly don't need to tell Angela Rayner how poorly care staff are treated. She's lived it as a care worker who's become deputy leader of the Labour Party and I hope the next deputy prime minister of our country. We know the impossible choices families are having to make every day. That's why the next Labour government will guarantee sick pay for all workers, so that's one less difficult choice for people to make. And it's also why we'll introduce a fair pay agreement to give adult care workers a seat at the table with your employers to negotiate better pay. Yesterday, the government announced it will rely more on volunteers in social care. The volunteer spirit demonstrated by the British people during the pandemic ought to be a source of pride for all of us, and social care needs all the help it can get. But my message to the government is this. Don't mistake the help a volunteer can provide with the effort, support and skill of a professional care worker. Labour's approach will be to professionalise the care sector, offering new chances for career progression. And I'll give you an example. Keir set out in Labour's health mission the shift that is required from an NHS that's focused on treating sickness to one that catches problems early. The NHS will have to work closer with social care to deliver that. We want to give care workers the training and opportunity to carry out things like blood pressure checks, meaning better care for people and a bigger role played by staff. Our second priority is proper support for family carers. Some people are lucky enough to be in jobs which allow them to arrange their work around the needs of their loved ones. But for many family carers, that flexibility doesn't exist. We want to make it easier for carers to stay in work and help look after their family members. Labour will give every family carer the right to request flexible working. The third is making sure quality care is available to everyone in need. We will introduce national standards, which all providers must meet. Too many private equity-owned care homes are failing to provide basic levels of care to residents, and they are gambling with their residents' futures at the same time as leaching hundreds of millions of pounds out of taxpayers' and residents' pockets. We are not going to tolerate providers who are failing to provide a safe and decent level of care, and we are not going to sit back and allow more care homes to be saddled with debt 
risking another major collapse that leaves residents in the lurch. That's why Labour will require all care providers to offer good quality care, run their services in a financially responsible way, and pay their taxes. And if they fail to meet these contractual terms, we will kick them out. You may have seen some of the scurrilous attacks in the press recently about Labour's fiscal credibility. Unbelievably, this is the shameless new line of attack from the party who brought us Liz Truss and the Kamikaze budget, who crashed the economy, sent interest rates through the roof, and have left the public finances in a total mess. But we know why they do it. They want people to believe that Labour is making promises that the nation can't afford, and they also want to kill off any hope that things can be better than they are after 13 years of Tory failure. Labour must not fall into this trap. That is why I have to make it crystal clear that today's report is not Labour Party policy. Our manifesto will be fully costed and fully funded. We won't be making any promises in our manifesto unless we are 100% sure we can keep them. This isn't just about Labour's credibility, by the way. It is about public trust in politics. People who receive and deliver care have been let down time and again by broken Tory promises. I'm not going to repeat their mistakes. There will be no well-meaning wishful thinking before an election, only to see promises broken by contact with the hard realities of government. That would only add insult to injury. Instead, we'll be honest with ourselves, with you, and with the country about what we can actually deliver in the first term of a Labour government. That's why this report is so important, because it gives us a lot to think about and reflect on as we think about Labour's next manifesto and our longer term ambitions over a decade of Labour government. And I'm enormously grateful to everyone who gave evidence as part of the review process and to Andy and Ben for producing such a thorough and comprehensive work. I'm also delighted that Unison have given their full backing to this process because in the coming months we'll be consulting with care providers, care workers and crucially with care users. I'm committed to making sure that our policies are co-produced in partnership with them. People who are experts by experience, either of receiving care or of delivering care. That's why I've been talking through some of these issues with many of you already um, from Unison. Uh, and earlier this week, I was with a group of care workers at the GMB con Congress down in Brighton. The changes we've set out are the first steps the next Labour government will take on the road to building a national care service. This is unfinished business for us. The last Labour government promised to deliver a national care service in 2010. 13 years later, and the cost of four election defeats is that thousands of people are denied the care they need. We can only deliver for those people with a Labour government. That's the prize available to us at the next election. So thanks again, Ben and Andy, for this important piece of work. Thank you, Christina and Unison, my trade union, uh, for commissioning it. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing um, from Christina next. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wes. I think, oh yes, I'm working now, apparently that one's not working. Um, so as you've heard, um, Unison uh, supported this work and so it's really uh, great that we have uh, now to reflect on the report. Um, Christina McAnee, who is the General Secretary of Unison, over to you, Christina. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Anna, and thanks to everyone for coming to this. Um, can I also echo a huge thank you to Andy and Ben for such a fantastic report and to the Fabian Society for taking this on. Um, and I also want to thank from within Unison, um, Guy Collis and Gavin Edwards, who are standing at the back there, for all the work they've done in working with you and on, on producing this report and for all the work they do all the time in supporting our care workers. Um, so this this report is uh, extremely comprehensive. Uh, it has already achieved widespread engagement from across the sector, and I believe it strikes just the right balance between being sufficiently ambitious, given the current state of this care sector, but it also provides a, 
a practical, realistic roadmap for overhaul and renewal. And a huge thank you, of course, to Wes um, for joining us today. It means, uh, you know, it's incredibly important to us that we're able to have this ongoing dialogue with the party uh, about what will actually happen. But as Wes has said, we commissioned this because it is such an important issue. And the hope is that it will provide a really important contribution to the wider social care debate and specifically to the development of a national care service. And we will, of course, as, as an affiliated union, be feeding it through the Labour Party's policy-making process that they do. Um, but I also want to echo some of what um, Wes has said. None of us know what the state of the economy of the country will be like uh, after the next general election. And so I absolutely realise why Wes and his colleagues in the, in the Treasury and indeed across the party um, can't give hard financial commitments today and we wouldn't expect this but I, I am pleased that they've accepted that this is such an important contribution to the debate about the future of a national care service um, and you know we, we are not trying to put the party in a difficult position but I do want to say thank you so much Wes for all the support you've always shown when we have these discussions about a national care service. You know, much has been said about the need to raise standards and the status of the adult social care system, and lots too about the need for a national care service. But this report is the first time I think we've had a detailed plan for how a future government could go about implementing this. It's got realistic timescales, milestones and mechanics, all essential if we're to move on from the current crisis-focused way that social care is delivered. At Unison, we're acutely aware of the pitfalls of governments getting this wrong. You only have to look at what happened in Scotland recently, um, where the SNP have produced a plan for a national care services that manages to be both excessively centralised and a charter for outsourcing, and that's quite an achievement. Uh, change is required more desperately than ever, um, but it must be the right change because it's too important to get this wrong. We've seen what happens when a negligent government promises reform and then fails to deliver. Staff shortages, low pay and plummeting morale. Thousands going without the support they need. Care delivered by the minute, not by, by necessity. Profit put ahead of quality. And today's report exposes, uh, proposes the building blocks that would allow us to make huge strides in addressing each of these major failings across the current system in England and I would argue across the UK too. And there is support for radical fundamental reform from across the political landscape. I've been in platforms with the current Chancellor. He is still the Chancellor, I think, isn't he? Yeah. Um, uh, I've been on platforms with him where, when he was chair of the uh, Health Select Committee and, and as, as, as you said, he agreed in the need to have fundamental change in the sector and the need to have proper reform in terms of the workforce. So as the largest union in this sector, you won't be surprised to hear that the workforce is of fairly important to us as a, as a trade union. Uh, there's wide consensus in the sector. And that's from unions, it's from providers, from many employer organisations, from many organisations that provide care, uh, even private sector employers and service users alike, that something has to be done about the workforce. That you can't bring about meaningful change in social care unless you address the problems in the workforce. And this report makes clear that we need a new workforce settlement and that should be the first priority in establishing a national care service and working out from that. And this would mean national minimum standards, much needed consistency when it comes to essentials such as pay, training, sick pay and pensions. All part of boosting the status of the workforce and thereby of the sector as a whole. Because improving the adult social care system has to be focused on people. Older people, disabled people who depend on those services or at home or in a, a residential care, but also the workforce that delivers the care and support. So I'm really pleased that we have several Unison Care Worker members here with us today. I'm looking around to try to see some. I was speaking to them earlier. We have, we have with us today people like Sarah, Alex, 
Kim, Barbara, Kerry Ann, and Sam, who I think is sitting at the front here, people who worked through the worst of the COVID pandi pandemic, people who were doing a job where they were going in to look after people with COVID, and then if they caught it, weren't getting sick pay when they went off sick. I mean, it's almost unbelievable that that was happening. They deserve so much more than the current broken system we have. And of course, no government can or should progress any proposals about the future of the care service without the input and involvement of service users. So really, I know that that's something that's very close to Wes's heart. This has to be a service that works for them and meets their needs. And in unison, we have a very active disabled workers group, and we have been discussing this with them. Uh, and we represent, we think, around 200,000 disabled workers in Unison. So it's a big issue for us in the union, and we do take into account their views. We talk to them about policy uh, development as it goes forward. Today's report pulls no punches on highlighting how dysfunctional the social care sector has become. And as we've pointed out repeatedly, you can't just continue to throw money at an unreformed system because too much of it fails to reach the services and the people who need it. There was a, a, a thing happened a couple of years ago where the government suddenly announced they were going to put some additional money in. And I remember at the time thinking, how will that actually get to the care workers? And I made a prediction, which I'm sad to say came true, and I thought, I bet most of it goes into advertising. And true enough, then suddenly all these adverts appeared saying, come and join the social care workforce. And I thought, how much did this cost? Instead of actually putting the money into improving the pay and conditions of the people who work in that service. We need to make clear that we can't tolerate that level of waste. That it, because there is money in the sector, and we see it in the way that money is drained out by private equity. Uh, that's led to billions leaking out of the system in the form of profits or interest payments. And many of these operations do not, of course, pay their, the right a level of tax in the UK. But the challenge in the future has to be how can we be even more ambitious and ensure that every taxpayer pound goes to improving the quality of care. We need to change the narrative about social care. It's not a drain in our economy. It is a driver of our economy. It is an essential part of the infrastructure that keeps this economy ticking. Just as people as trains need to run, just as people need roads that they can, they can drive on, we need a care service. And this report should give us all confidence that a different future is possible. It does genuinely feel to me, and I hope to you too, that this generation of politicians and policy makers do have an opportunity to make that once in a lifetime shift, to make history when it comes to a national care service, one where the value of social care is properly recognised, where those that depend on the sector get the services they need, and where care workers receive the pay, training and respect that they so desperately deserve. There is a long way to go. The report makes that abundantly clear. But bringing about a fairer, better, more consistent system should not be beyond us. We should be bold. We should be ambitious. And we should end that sticking plaster approach to social care. And actually, let's go for some radical surgery. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Christina. So, um, unfortunately, Wes has got another engagement to go to, but if we can, we're going to just try and squeeze in one question, which is from somebody who draws on care and support. Svetlana from Social Inclusion, would you like to quickly ask your question? Thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, thanks a lot. I'm Svetlana from Inclusion London. It's a disabled people's organisation. So, for us, care is much more than being clean and fed and safe. Um, for us, it's an enabling service that helps us to live a fulfilling life. At the moment, we have to fight for every bit of support. We don't get it. Moreover, some of us have to give up our disability benefits to pay for it. So it, we need a radical reform. And I guess my question is um, for Ben, how does report help to put 
social care in the context of our rights? And for Wes, will you, last Labour government, ratified UN Convention on Rights of Disabled People, with, which talks about right to live independently and be included in the community. When you develop reform, will it be informed by this international obligation? And will thank you, you, if necessary, legislate to fully incorporate this right? Okay, thank you. I don't know where to Yeah, I can't just jump. I'm so sorry. I really hate leaving um, things early. So I'm firstly really sorry. I want to make sure we got one question um, from people who, who are absolutely affected by um, by care issues. So just to your point, firstly, I absolutely uh, completely agree with you about the kind of conversation we need to have about what social care is and for. And of course, personal care, whether for people you know, young or of working age disabled people or older people is important but it is about so much more and it is about being an enabling service so that everyone, whatever their background or indeed their disability, can achieve every single ounce of their potential. Um, and so when you hear us talk about social care and who it's for and what the service is there to deliver, you can absolutely expect from us that, to hear disabled people being at the core of the narrative. And more than that, I mean, there are in addition to what I said in my speech about the importance of fiscal discipline and making sure that every promise we make is fully costed and fully funded, uh, another reason why we, we're taking the recommendations that are being made today um, as part of a, an ongoing conversation rather than the final product and making commitments today is because we need to have that conversation with people who are both delivering care but also in receipt of care as well and you have my commitment that Labour's policies in relation to social care but other aspects of policy that affect disabled people will be co-produced uh, and done very much in consultation with disabled people so thank you very much for your question thanks everyone for the contribution and um, don't worry I'm leaving some spies in the room um, to pick up <laughs> the rest of the conversation um, in the Q&A and this is very much the beginning of the conversation not the end so thank you very much for having so, so I think as we've all acknowledged, this uh, report opens up actually a really fantastic, I think, cross-party discussion about where we want to go in terms of the future of, of social care. And it's very aligned, I think, to quite a number of reports, but puts some of the flesh on the bone, I think, in terms of the practical uh, and how this would be implemented. Um, so I don't know, Ben, if you wanted to pick up anything from Svetlana's question before we um, go to our other questioners. I think just that, you know, if, it, if we were to have a national care service that was just about keeping clean, I don't think that meets this, uh, either meets the scale of the challenge or the promise that a national care service can actually deliver. I um, mean, you know, Andy talked about security and peace of mind. And I think, you know, peace of mind that knowing you can do what you currently do and enjoy in the future, regardless of whatever happens, is a crucial part of the National Care Service. And hopefully, whenever we see the white paper and the legislation that we may see in the future next Labour government, hopefully well-being and independence and choice and control and all of those things that will make a National Care Service really important to the lives of disabled and older people will be at the heart. So one of the things that um, the report recognises is the huge um, uh, value of unpaid family carers. And so I'm pleased for our next question that we're going to go to Zara, who herself um, has been a carer. So question from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, it's been very interesting to hear from everyone this morning. Um, so my name is Zara and I'm based in London. I am a former carer. I used to look after my mum who had renal failure, a series of strokes and then subsequently lymphoma. So I dealt with end of life and palliative care at home. And I come from a family of carers. My dad cared for my grandparents. So it's something I've always seen and known. During COVID, I shielded and uh, abided by all the relevant rules and was trying to work at the same time. I was a property lawyer, so quite demanding in its own right, and I had to make the decision to give up work to continue caring for mum, which wasn't a decision that I took lightly, but felt that that was my only choice. And so 
for me, supporting families, because it's not just the person we care for and the carer, we are intrinsically linked. Any decision that I make for my mum in the role of the care I provide for her directly impacts my life and my future decisions. And so it's about making informed decisions and not desperate decisions based at the end of a long night and no choice or the best of a worst bunch of choices. Um, and so it's whether the care or quality care could have helped me stay in work longer perhaps, mm. or even whether the care is, is an economic issue as well as investing in yeah. families and whether the families will see those differences mm. and the changes that are being put forward and how quickly. Thank, thank you very much, um, Zara. So I'll go to Andy to you yeah. first to sort of outline what you're proposing for um, unpaid carers and what difference you think a national care service could make. Yes. So the report does talk quite a lot about the essential contribution of unpaid carers, but also the importance of paid care and unpaid care side by side, both to ensure that that caring relationship is sustainable and to help uh, carers of working age to work alongside their their care and we sort of say that that is part of the business case for spending more money on social care because we have huge labour market shortages we need more care, unpaid carers in the future but we also need them to more of them to be working so uh, you know the, the national care service is partly a solution for that conundrum of you know sort of family care um, we make some proposals for unpaid carers. One of the building blocks, there are 10 building blocks in this um, report. One of them is specifically on unpaid carers. And we basically argue that there needs to be a clear, fair deal for unpaid carers so that some of their existing rights are better communicated and you know, properly realised because there's an awful lot that sort of is supposed to happen for unpaid carers that honestly doesn't. So it's partly about councils telling everyone in a caring relationship what they are entitled to. But also, we think, going further as well. So we talk about a new right to uh, short breaks for carers and also a new referral system so that where the DWP or the NHS knows that you're a carer, as it does of, very often, that it tells the National Care Service or the local authority. Because at the moment, we have far fewer people who are unpaid carers receiving any support or contact from the, the council than those who are out there, you know, known to their GP, known to the benefit system. So it's just about the public sector joining up properly to give a proper package of support to carers. So, um, Christina, obviously you will have a lot of members, I'm sure, who are also juggling care. We heard from where's a commitment already from Labour about right to request flexibility um, for, um, for carers from the start of work. What, what views do you have about the sort of how a national care service could be supporting carers in their role? Yeah, I mean, one of the issues we have in the union is that we are pushing things with employers around flexible working uh, and support for carers. That's something that comes up at our conference probably every year, and it's, we have people who are producing advice and guidance on it. But the issue always is, um, what does that actually mean for people who are carers? Because the lack of support, the lack of joined up services. And so I think this is all very much part and parcel of the same thing. You, if you fix one little bit of the, the system, but you don't fix the rest of the system, that bit soon breaks down again. And it's about trying to have that um, holistic approach, a joined up approach to what we mean by a national care service. Because you're absolutely right, it's not, it's not, it's not the workforce, it's not just the workforce, it's not just the people who actually receive the care but it's about the, the families who also depend on those systems. So I think if we get it right, if we had a national care system, and it's not going to happen overnight, um, but and the key thing is that we take everybody's voices into account. And I was really pleased to hear Wes's commitment to that. And certainly we're aware of that as a trade union, because many of our members are carers, and they tell us what their life is like and what the key issues are for them. So the third question, I'm going to invite Sam, who's a Unison member and uh, works in the care sector. So Sam, if you'd like to uh, take the microphone and ask your question. Thank you. Hi. Um, Go it. for it. Try it now. They'll have turned it on. Don't. Yeah, that's fine. Go for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi. My name is Sam Thornton. Um, I'm in care of uh, 30 years. I work for a company called uh, Diamond Care. Uh, we do Um, so, over the last 33 years, care has changed immensely. Um, I cannot tell you how much I've been trained and not really recognised um, for it. And I've just lost my friends. 
Um, originally, when I worked for the NHS, I got two big over in my current role. Um, over the years, my, as I said, my goals has changed. Um, such a care work is at the beginning that holds the care industry together. No one will ever know what that role entails until you've walked a mile in our shoes. It's not only a job, it's a vocation. Um, days, nights, weekends, Christmases, all carers have missed these. Uh, we are totally undervalued and underpaid, and the responsibility is unbelievable and aware of men at times. In a hostile environment, I would be able to give a paracetamol, but in my environment, I can give controlled drugs and provide very complex care for just over the minimum wage. So things do have to change. This is why I support this national service. Vacancies and recruitment are at all time low and the health and care industry is just on its knees. Dimensions should not be going cap in hand every year to authorities for a slight base which should be a given. Can you tell me more about how we can move on from the current crisis to a national settlement of care workers in the way that the NHS workers have done and how do you plan to encourage new applicants into our vital care and roles after all, we are all going to get older one day, and we will need care ourselves. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, Ben, in the report, you outline quite a lot about workforce and the importance of valuing uh, the workforce. Um, do you want to just elaborate a little bit on that in response to Sam's points, please? Sure. Well, I thought you were going to go to Andy, but I can, uh, well, I I can, uh, I can do it. Um, I think the first thing, um, firstly, Sam, thank you for um, all the work that you have done. Um, as someone who's a trustee of a social care charity, uh, I also know how important, and you know, the charity wouldn't run without um, people uh, like you. And you mentioned that social care is a vocation, and that, that is absolutely true. But unfortunately, it being a vocation doesn't pay the bills. And in the middle of a cost of living crisis, when you can get a higher wage elsewhere, people understandably, if unfortunately, do go elsewhere. So when it comes to a fair workforce settlement, it absolutely has to start with pay and paying people, carers, more. So that is what the one thing that I hope that uh, WES will do with um, very quickly to, in, um, we suggest a, a social care minimum wage so that the social care sector has a higher minimum wage than is currently uh, for the country. Um, we've also suggested a lot of other changes around terms and condition, making sure that you, uh, carers are paid um, for the things that they do when under some contracts that uh, they are not paid. Um, we've also, as um, both Christina and Wes indicated, as part of larger um, contract negotiations, stuff like sick pay uh, would be, uh, there would be full um, sick pay. But I think, you know, I, I go back to my initial point that if we want more care workers to be in the sector, and obviously we do because of, you know, we, the demand uh, in social care is rising because of fantastic advances in um, you know, medicine and, and living longer. We are just going to have to pay carers more, and I think that is the sort of you just can't get around that. Yeah. You just you, if you if you want more care workers, you're just going to have to pay them more. I don't think within this country there is a dearth of people wanting to be carers and wanting to be in the job. I think a lot of people want to be doing it, but if it doesn't pay the bills, people can't do it, and that's what we've got to change. Yeah. So often it's seen as an unskilled and, and low paid job. How do we change uh, the, the view, I guess, and how do we give this value and recognition that your members who are care workers so deserve, Christina? Yeah, thank, thanks, Sam, and thanks to the other um, care worker members who've travelled to be here today. Um, one of the big frustrations for me is that care work is too often seen as, well, a care worker is a care worker is a care worker. There's no differentiation between different levels of skills in too many employers uh, and no recognition of the fact that, you know, you'll be dealing with um, uh, service users who have got varying levels of need um, or who want different things from a care service. So sometimes it is the very personalised, direct support and assistance, 
or it's medical interventions, or it's about being able to live independently, and it's the support that goes around all of that. And um, but there's no there's no differentiation in most employers. Now we have a good relationship with Dimensions, your employer. It's one of the ones we we have a recognition agreement with. We work closely with them, um, and I recognise that for many of them. The problem is lack of funding, so they don't get that funding, and then it's you know local authorities or people who commission the service don't get enough money to commission on the level, and it's one of these kind of like, almost like a negative cycle we're in, and we have to change that, and we do that I think by getting uh, the national recognition about the role of care workers in the NHS. For those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, we have a scheme called the Agenda for Change scheme, and the Agenda for Change is the, is the, nego the name of the, the, the bargaining structure, if you like. It's the pain, pain conditions agreement that covers everyone except doctors and dentists in the NHS, and it's very structured. I'm not saying it's perfect, but you have bands. Band, well, we don't have band one anymore, but we have band two, band three, band four, band, band five as a nurse, uh, and, and you'll have. And they have job descriptions that go along with it. They have uh, job evaluation scores that mm. go along with it. This is bread and butter to us as trade unions. This is not rocket science. Uh, I've said this to the government many times. If you want us to come up with a, 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 a grading structure for care workers, no problem. We could probably have this for you in a couple of months. Not a big deal. Um, so it is possible to do it, and provided you have the money attached to it where you pay people for the jobs that they do, and these are the jobs that employers, providers, looking at their client group, would say we need people with these skills to deliver for our particular client base. Thank you. I, I might just um, come to you as well. There's a number of reports, including uh, the one for ADAS and uh, mm. your own, suggesting that a priority for early uh, investment uh, of a new government would be to put money into to pay in the workforce. How do your proposals ensure that that money actually goes into the pockets of people like Sam? Um, you know, what, what are the safeguards that across all providers um, that it, they would be respecting these sort of fair pay agreements? How would it work? So initially, I think it would need to be based on goodwill uh, because there wouldn't be new legislation. You just need to get on and you know, stabilise the, the sector. Um, but I think there is goodwill. I think you know, most of the providers we've talked to say we desperately want to pay our our people more, but we need the money to do it. Um, but there is a need for law change as well. Um, Wes has talked about the Labour Party's broader package of employment sort of rights, and that would include this new structure of fair pay agreements, which would be binding sector-wide agreements. Um, so that would be for any employer in the social care sector. Um, but over time, we in the report also argue that for anyone contracted by government by the National Care Service, uh, the independent providers who are under contract uh, would have binding conditions to basically comply with what Christine has just talked about, an equivalent to agenda for change for the social care world. It wouldn't be identical because there are, there, it's a different employer landscape, but the idea of career structure and clear pay bans and all of that, if it's good enough for the NHS, why shouldn't people doing similar sorts of jobs in care and support, often arguably with higher skills, they're working independently in people's homes, uh, why should they not also have that sort of, um, you know, sort of reward and recognition? Great. Um, so we're now going to be opening up to general questions from you, the audience. So if you would like to indicate that you um, have a question, I'm going to try and take as many as possible. So um, I'll start by doing it in sort of rounds of three uh, and then come back to the panel um, and we'll try and at least fit in um, a couple of, of rounds of questions. So um, I'm going to start. Is there a raving mic, Katie, or do you want this one? Yes, there is. Okay. I'd like to start with the lady at the front here, please. And, um, the flowery dress. <laughs> if you'd like to say who you are, if you're from an organisation or if you're here in a personal capacity, whatever, it'd be great before you ask your question. Thank you. Carolina from the Care Workers Charity. Uh, so we're a benevolent fund for care workers. Since 2020, we've had to pay out over £5 million pounds to over 9,000 care workers in emergency grants because care workers don't get paid enough to pay for basics like bills and food. So it was very good to hear that you see workforce and pay settlement as a priority to, to start anything in terms of national care service. 
Um, but it was interesting to see that you didn't consider anything like a professional body for care workers, uh, which I would see as one of priorities to really reform the social care work workforce, to give the workforce a sense of belonging, which they don't have, and I think is quite a big issue in yep. terms of the workforce well-being. So I Thank think you. it would be a good consideration as part of this whole big plan as well. Uh, and another thing around registration, that consideration around voluntary or compulsory, and one other thing around skills for care. I think skills for care being a useful body and maybe considering being an arm's length body that doesn't rely so he heavily on the Department of Health uh, and Social okay. Care as well. So just a few Great. There. So some questions there about professionalisation, registration and so on. I'm going to go to Jeremy in the middle. I'll come to this side next. I'll do this side first. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. And we're looking forward to you being a champion for the National Care Service in Parliament next year, which would be great. Um, so it's a really good bit of work that Ben and Andy have done. It's a phenomenal piece of work. I'm Jeremy Hughes. I'm director of the Technology Enabled Care Action Alliance, which brings together voluntary sector, private sector, and public sector with an interest in technology. And I think one, uh, we know that the National Care Service is 75 years late. But one thing that's changed over that time is technology. And in recent years, we've tended to see technology used as an excuse to either cut jobs or save money. How do we reset that and make sure that we use technology to enhance and improve the skills and experience of the workforce, to improve and reduce the isolation of carers and the people they, who, do, who call on care services, and probably very significantly comment on the way to reduce unnecessary hospital stays and admissions by the better use of technology? Thank, thanks, Jeremy. And I think there's a lady at the back, um, on the back row. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Mary Ann Stevenson from the Women's Budget Group, and we very much welcome this report as well. It's a brilliant, really useful piece of work, um, and I really think it's really important where you've started with, you know, what is the care service for? What are we actually trying to do here? Um, one thing I would say is, while I recognise that you're right, more money is not enough, we also need to change the way care is delivered. We do actually need to talk about the money as well, um, following up on what Christina was saying, you know, there is a reason why care workers are badly paid. It's because care providing organisations don't get enough money from local authorities who don't get enough money from central government. Um, and I think we need to sort of avoid a sense of wishful thinking that things can be resolved through reform. We actually need significant investment in our care infrastructure. As Christina said earlier, it is a form of social infrastructure. It underpins the economy and is significant as road and rail. And I think we do need to have a conversation that is about how much money um, this would cost and recognise that this is an important investment in all of our futures. Okay, I'm going to take one more, which is the gentleman, I think, with the beard, and then I'm going to have to come to the panel, and then I'll take some on the other side. Yeah, last question. Uh, so I'm Luke John Davies. I'm on Favourite NEC. I'm a cancer in Smethwick. I'm also an unpaid carer for my partner, a disabled man myself, so I've got a little bit of an interest to declare, I suppose, in this conversation, and I'm also halfway through my shop steward training with Unison, so um, <laughs> in the right place, really. Uh, thank you. So my, my day job, I'm the policy officer for the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. And a huge part of my job at the moment is about hospital discharge and getting into uh, getting patients into care so that we have beds for each to try and deal with the backlog. So my question is, what is the report saying about that interface between the National Health Service and the National Care Service? Because that is absolutely key. You know, you go into care because of a health issue, and that handover between the two um, is absolutely crucial, particularly when you're, you know, the sort of first six weeks coming out of hospital that's discussed in the report and so on. Yep. So yeah, thank you. More details on that, please. Right, thank you. So I'm not going to expect you to take all of them. So um, I'll start with Andy. Do you want to pick up perhaps on the money question or? Uh, yes. So, I mean, money does obviously sit over this and, you know, Wes has been very clear that the Labour Party isn't going to commit before an election. Uh, we are very clear in this report that billions of pounds extra will need to be spent by, to be honest, any party in government. But is it going to be knee-jerk, emergency, one crisis after an another funding, or is it going to be a long-term plan? So we, we, we basically say that you probably need to spend more money in the first year just to stabilise the system, but you need a 10-year commitment 
um, from the Prime Minister and the Chancellor to increases every year. And what that will do is to create the certainty and stability in which people can develop the capacity, know that you know, it may not be great in year one or two, but there is a direction of travel. And actually, this links into the point about technology as well. You know, if providers have a clear framework that there will be this sort of financial certainty, they can start to invest. They can invest in facilities where there is no, apart from private equity, no one invests in facilities because the price is so low, but they also there are constraints on their investment in tech as well. Um, so it's the, it, the quantum of money massively matters, but having a stable sort of direction of travel on money so that you know there's going to be fair pricing over time and fair wages that would increase in a negotiated way over time um, also uh, massively matters. And I thought it was interesting in the report that you sort of draw a very clear line that part of the problem of why we haven't made progress on social care reform is that we got stuck on the question of revenue raising. Yeah. And you've really just put to bed and said, well, that's a question for Treasury. We need to be saying what does social care need and that it should be uh, getting more public spending. And that's basically your bottom line, isn't it? Well, we have uh, social, adult social care is a relatively small budget compared to overall government spending and, and indeed compared to the NHS and the state pension, like the other big drivers associated with an ageing population. And it sort of got stuck over the years with the, you know, with the death tax and the deal not process and, you know, everything. Was, revenue sort of has got in the way of sensible public service reform debates, which involve money, but, but change in the system as well. And that just to answer LJ's question about hospital discharge is yes, one of those reform yeah. issues. Yeah. Um, so most, so we, we, very, we were very persuaded by the argument that adult social care and the NHS should be two separate things. They're there to do two, two different things uh, for different people often. Uh, but the sort of crisis, health emergency and discharge from hospital moment is the exception. And here we basically say that local government and the NHS should jointly commission free services around the sort of discharge from hospital, preventing readmission, um, because it is, you know, this is where the cracks have fallen. Both, both the NHS and social care are failing on that uh, sort of rehabilitative support um, offer. Um, so we must sort of like say, is you're both responsible for this, working together, um, and honestly, it's better commissioning, more money on both sides of that fence. Okay, I'm going to turn to Christina to pick up the questions from the um, Care Workers Charity. Hi, yeah, thanks for your, for your question. I mean, I think on the issue of registration, yeah, we, we would absolutely agree that the, there should be registration for care workers, as in you're sending people in to do often very incredibly intimate uh, services for people, and yet we have no registration process uh, and, you know, that would actually link skills to what you can do as a care worker. I think that having a professional body is a good idea. I'm not sure it's in and of itself will solve any of the problems. I think it's something that might come out organically after we get to what, you know, we, we get some sort of structure in place. The idea of having a professional body, I think, is useful. Um, uh, I mean, you'll find, I think, trade unions believe that we give a professional support to many of our members, not just us, other unions as well would say that. But I think there is a role probably for something around, uh, around that. Um, we work closely with Skills for Care, um, uh, and I think they do a really good job in, in what they do. Uh, but yeah, there is an issue about how closely linked they are to, I suppose, the Department for Health and whether there's a, a need to... to, to look differently at how it's staffed and, and what the kind of uh, resources it gets and what advice it gives. Can I just touch on the, 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 the budget thing as well, which I think is really interesting, just to add to what you, um, to what you said. Um, it is important, obviously, to talk about money, and we always, this is always thrown back at us, is, well, who's going to pay for this? And just to emphasise what, what you just said there, which is this is very much a government decision. And you know, you look around at pet projects that ministers have, and then and there's money allocated to them, um, or mistakes that are made uh, by government. You know, so we're still apparently dealing with 30 billion pounds uh, fallout from the whole Liz Trust, you know, disaster. 
But then there's all sorts of things around um, taxation. You know, we know the amount of money that goes out in tax breaks to certain individuals, high, high net worth individuals, and companies that don't pay their taxes. And if government was really, if, if, if FA government was really serious about this, about raising money through tax revenue, they could do it, provided this became a priority. So all of these things are, it depends on what government chooses as a priority. You know, we, we would say this is all a choice for individual governments. The money is there, because uh, it's not a massive yeah. amount we're talking about here. If we were to fund all of this, um, it's not like the NHS. But oh, and just to say that the this link between the NHS and uh, care is absolutely intrinsic. You can't break it. And when I've been going round talking to NHS trusts, we you might have seen we've had dispute in the NHS. <laughs> been going out talking to many of our members, and I've also met the chief execs, the deputy chief, chief execs of a number of of trusts. And I can't think of a single one that didn't mention when we talked about waiting times and ambulances queuing outside centres. The fact that all of them talked social. about the social care, every one of them. So can you just quickly pick up on the tech question, Ben? And then I'm going to ask, because we started a bit late, mm. if we might just run over by five so much <coughs> to allow a few questions from this side of the room. So Ben. I think just quickly um, on the tech question, um, what is absolutely crucial is that any decisions over technology in social care is co-produced with those who will use it in terms of the workforce and those who will use it in terms of the disabled and uh, older people. Um, and yes, there will be standards that need to be decided at, you know, at white pole level, but I think a lot of it is actually going to be done um, at the local council and even at the individual either care home or the, the individual going into someone's home. So that there will there should be national standards and we, you know, Wes will hopefully be, uh, you know, pushing those national standards as part of his uh, responsibilities under the national care service that we set out. But ultimately, it's going to be a decision for at the local level. Okay. So, can those that were expressing questions on this side put your hands up again? I'm going to take again just a quick fire of three or four, get some quick responses, and hope to have you out of here um, in in about ten minutes. So, we'll start, with Caroline. I think I've got the same problem as Mike. Um, I think it's working good. Caroline Abraham, um, Charity Director of ATK, one of the co chairs of the Care and Sports Alliance. Um, I love this report, so congratulations to Andy and everyone involved. I, I wanted to draw attention to two areas which I think aren't often discussed. One, one thing that blew my socks off in the report is to say that actually 5% of all jobs in the, U in the UK, or at least in England, one or other, are in social care. That's a huge number. And that suggests to me that if we can get it right in social care, then we can do much more. We can have other social and social economic benefits, particularly in local areas. The other point, which sort of links really, is gender equality. Mm -hmm. So the fact that if we can if we can make progress on lots of issues we've talked about, but particularly for students raised today, then we would make real progress on gender equality. Mm -hmm. I wonder if anyone on the panel would like to say something about those things. Okay, go to the row behind. Um, yep, gentlemen in glasses. Thank you. Uh, hello, um, Chairman Chaney, Social Care Today. Uh, question for Andrew Harrow. Um, I think it's an interesting report. Uh, I understand the pacing of long term reform, the need to get it right, etc. But I'm quite concerned that under what you proposed, the care system would remain in crisis for about two or three years until the government. Um, even when you have this early emphasis on some payments, I think around 10 point and 9 an hour, that's over than what Amazon pays, that's over than what the supermarkets pay. Um, I want to ask, how much money is required early on to stabilise the system? You know, do you have that or a bit more money? And also, um, have you tempered your proposals and based on your proposals and the extent of them to try and fit within? an uh, assumed fiscal envelope or a communicated fiscal envelope envelope that Labour will be working towards in part. You know, has this been okay. fitted within the needs of the shadow treasury? We're short for time. Thank you. So um, a couple of rows back. Um, a woman, yes, with your hand there. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Evelyn Cotton. I'm the Eve member for Amazon Trigger in the Council. Um, I'm welcome to this report, actually. Um, if you're excited for the vision of our national care service, 
especially in this economy uh, environment. I think my question is from a local uh, authority point of view. Mm -hmm. So with twenty twenty resources, aging population, and increased need, how do you see the role of local authority changing in a new world of a national care service? Okay, thank you very much. Um, Christina, um, would you sort of, I mean, you mentioned yourself the social and economic benefits. Um, how, how important is that in terms of, um, and this issue of gender equality that Caroline raised? Yeah, thanks, Caroline. I mean, it's really central to some of the, the, this discussion, actually, I think, in some ways. We know that the majority of the workforce are women. We know there's a high percentage of, of black workers in it. Um, uh, we know there's a, a large percentage of people who are, uh, who are themselves carers and, and, and have other responsibilities. Um, we make the point, we've had research done over the years that shows that particularly, something I say when I speak to, to some of our members is, when you give care workers or health workers or any, anybody else I would consider our members a pay rise, they don't sit there and think, mm, what stocks and shares will I buy? Or how, will I go and invest in a second home in the south of France? They spend it in the local community. They buy things in local shops. They, you know, they take their children to the local cinema. They go to the local cafe, uh, and so that all helps generate. That's that's. How, I would argue that's how you rebuild local local economies. Um, so that that is absolute. And there's lots of evidence that shows this. Something like somebody from my team will hopefully be able to remind me, but it's something like. I think 60 or 70 per cent of the money that you give public sector workers is spent in their local economy. That's where they spend it. Um, and of course, the whole thing about gender equality is critical to this. And I would argue gender and race equality as well, because it's about bringing up uh, standards of living for a whole workforce um, that earns a, you know, minimum wage or just slightly above it. Um, and I, I do think we should be ambitious. I think this relates to somebody else that's going to talk about it. I mean, I have to say we're we've, we're pushing the Labour Party for fifteen pounds an hour minimum, and I'm not I'm not embarrassed to say that. I think that's I don't think that's excessive. Um, so uh, we are ambitious as a union for this, uh, except the cost element, etc. But uh, I don't think that's that's too much to ask. And I think that impacts on the question that was asked about local authorities. Mm. There is a huge issue around funding for local government, and we all accept that. Um, and so there would have to be a settlement about how much money went to local authorities and whether that was going to be ring fenced around what, how you would commission services and social care, and whether that commissioning is based on certain standards. Um, uh, so, you know, it's. It's whether we could get, make that mandatory as opposed to voluntary as, as at the moment. Yeah. So I know you grappled with the national local. I think it was Christina mentioned about Scotland and the mm. SNP and the version of the national care service there was certainly not uh, welcomed by local government who felt that it was a very strong centralisation proposal. Do you want to just maybe reassure the colleague from Southwark about yeah. what the relationship between local authorities will be in this new care, national care service? Uh, absolutely, Evan. So, uh, thank you uh, for asking. We spoke to a lot of people in local government as part of this work, both councillors and, and officers. And our, our approach was to try to think what's the least that you can take to the centre possible. Uh, what are the things that even councillors are telling us that they can't discharge themselves, that there needs to be more national leadership, the financial settlement, and including a new grant and spending formula so that there's equal, equalised spending according to need between areas. Um, the issues about the workforce, some of this just has to be cracked at national level rather than local. So we were sort of trying to use existing structures, taking some of the responsibilities that sort of councils aren't in a position to discharge and, and making them national. But at the same time, empowering local government to do the local uh, sort of creating of services in communities with the sort of the framework and the money that they need to do that well, working with their communities. So I hope it's really good news for local government, even though there are some things where we're saying the centre has to do it. And I think that relates to the question about money and sort of political constraints, because one of the issues is, is not just about um, pushing more money into the system, but actually you have to phase it over time because capacity does not exist at the moment to sort of discharge the sort of ambition that we've got either in terms of providers or in terms of local government's ability to to commission so regardless of politics or the economy 
you have to sort of do this in a staged way rather than a sort of sudden sugar rush in terms of sort of new money and growth. Um, but there is also, to, totally upfront about this, there is a reality that there won't be the sorts of amount of money that the sector needs quickly in the first one or two years of a new government. And that's partly because of politics, but actually it's about the economy. You know, the, the, until the economy is in better shape and, you know, pay is growing, tax receipts are growing, and therefore there's more money for public spending, you won't see, so you'll see, I'm sure you'll see some increase in spending because the system will collapse otherwise, but you won't see the level that's needed for our ambition. And that's why we say it needs to be a 10 year program of, you know, very clear direction of travel, but having to be realistic that the pace of that journey will depend on, on the economy and on fiscal circumstances. So I'm just going to, um, we're going to uh, close now. I'm going to just ask each of the panel, perhaps if Wes were still here, uh, what one thing they would like to be saying to Wes um, coming out of this report in terms of um, their advice. And um, I'll start with Ben. Well, first, I'm not going to say what I think Christine may say about the workforce. I'm going to add an extra thing. That's not because I don't think the workforce is important. But I think that within the report, we make quite a, a series of recommendations that fundamentally changes the relationship between local government and providers so that they become licensed providers. Now, the reason why I highlight that as being so important is it, it comes to the funding point. At the moment, we've got a, a real problem where we're providing £20 billion into a system that a lot of the money doesn't go on care for the pe and support for people who need it. If we have licensed providers, we'll make sure any extra money goes to those uh, to the front line, but also may in the long term actually reduce how much money we do need to provide people to maintain a basic level or more than basic level of social care because it's not as Christina kind of indicated going into people's stocks and shares or going abroad. So I, I would say to Wes, so the workforce is important, more money is important, but we do need to change the relationship between providers and local government along the lines that we set out. Thanks, Ben. Christine? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it would be about the workforce and, and, um, and to be ambitious for what we think we can deliver for the workforce and, and you know, work in partnership with unions, with other organisations that represent the, the service users, the families who depend on it, actually work with us to come up with a structure that we think is deliverable and then you can co once you've done that it's you can cost these things um, but you have to start from somewhere and that for, er, for me that somewhere would be let's give a commitment to the fact that we're going to have a professionalized recognized workforce and make it a profession that people want to join and stay in thank you andy i'd say to wes be long-termist as health and social care secretary you just get buffeted from crisis to crisis and it always goes back to the nhs um, so listen to what wes said about jeremy hunt and his time as uh, health secretary and the regret he had about not sort of seeing the light on adult social care until it was too late so Wes, don't be Jeremy Hunt. So this, <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, Jeremy Hunt saw the light as select committee chair, but we, we need someone to, to, to have that long-termist approach on day one of being health and social care secretary. Yeah. I guess the other is we also will want to make sure that the chancellor uh, understands just how important investment in this sector is uh, to the wider economic and social uh, development in this country. So I guess I would be also wanting to make sure that this was on Rachel Reeves's inbox yeah. as well as on Wes's. Um, so thank you so much again to Unison for um, commissioning the report with, along with Wes, um, to Andy and Ben as the authors of this report from the Fabian Society. I think it is really excellent. I do urge you to get your hands on a copy, have a look at it. It's really, really practical about what needs to happen to actually deliver on a vision where care becomes a more universal entitlement that we do redefine that post-war welfare state settlement and finally um, put in place the funding and reform that we need so that we have that peace of mind uh, if we 
are disabled or into our old age. So I really commend the report and the work to you, and certainly I will do what I can um, to help support um, further reform of social care to keep this on the agenda of the Labour Party and to help shape um, uh, the Labour Party's policy um, going into the, the next election. So thank you all for coming uh, today and uh, for supporting the event. Um, so thanks very much. Thank you.